okay, wait a, wait a sec, you're going to have to sort of break this down a little bit for me, because frankly, everybody's saying, as far as I can tell, that the, you know, we needed to leave, it's the right thing to do. And, well, not everybody, but, but it's, there seems to be some kind of consensus and people are saying, well, it's just the way that it was done that's problematic. But you're saying that nobody or virtually nobody wanted to? Tell me more. In, yeah, in Washington, no one wanted to leave. I mean, a lot of people, when we describe, uh, when we describe Washington and we describe Pentagon, right, which is the world's lar largest and most powerful bureaucracy, they talk about the Pentagon and defense lobbyists, and they talk about weapon systems, and they talk about people like Liz, uh, Congresswoman Liz Cheney, defending the defense industry. Uh, you know, Liz Cheney was very much against withdrawing from Afghanistan, and she made that case against uh, against President Donald Trump. So there was a large constituency inside, inside of Congress uh, against withdrawing. But the important thing that people, that people don't quite understand is, because we're used to thinking about it again, uh, in terms of political alignment, that people on the right are warmongers. They like war. Uh, they like defense systems. They like money. They, they, they like donations coming from the defense industry. It's also on the left, right? Washington, um, Washington is a, a democratic city, right? The people who actually live there. I lived in Washington for many years. I can tell you there are no neighborhoods where Donald Trump walked away a winner. There, are, there were no neighborhoods that voted for uh, Mitt Romney or John McCain in Washington, D.C. It's a democratic city. That's the constituency for Democrats. All of these people, the reason that Washington got so large in the last 20 years is because the amount of money that was coming in, especially through Afghanistan, I had a relative, I have a relative who works at a company that became a, um, a, a company worth over hundreds of millions of dollars because of the USAID work, the development work they did in Afghanistan. So the money wasn't just going to people on the right. It's not just going to defense contractors. It was going to the left as well. The nice people that we see wearing the pink pussy hats uh, at the women's march and stuff like this, all the people on the left who are protesting against Donald Trump being a fascist and Hitler and this and this and that, all of their 401ks were tied up in Afghanistan. The amount of money that was going through Afghanistan on the left and the right is astonishing. That's how the city grew over 100,000 by over 100,000. I, I, I think at this point, probably by many, many more. I had that stat a few years ago, but in the last 20 years. So no one in Washington wanted to leave Afghanistan. You know, it's interesting that you say that. This actually reminds me of this uh, Spectator article that I read while we were preparing for this piece. Um, the title is, uh, Did Gender Studies Lose Afghanistan? They look into this Inspector General report on uh, you know the uh, Afghanistan effort, military effort, and they say that um, it's north of three quarters of a billion dollars were directly spent on gender initiatives in Afghanistan. I just thought that I mean that's a that's a, a huge amount of money. Right, um, that money. Afghanistan is a place where people laundered money to their own co constituents, right? I mean, I, 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 I did see that and I saw the 30 second clip of the young woman who I think has a British accent, but she's talking about Duchamp. Uh, she's talking about the, the R. Mutt urinal, which she's explaining to a bunch of, you know, to a bunch of Afghanis and it has to be translated. So not only is the art not understandable, but the language in which she's explaining it even has to be translated. This is for, this was for Americans and for Westerners. That money was for them. It was paying them off and keeping them on, keeping them on side with these different initiatives. That's what it was. It had nothing to do, most of these things had nothing to do with the, with the, with the people who live in Afghanistan. I mean, you know, they, they had to put them out there. Goodness knows how many people were really instructed in gender studies. Most likely the, the, the fewer, the better. But this was all to create jobs for Americans and other Westerners. If you saw the young woman teaching there, remember how many gender studies grads our, our universities 
um, produced these days, how many, um, how many women studies grads, how many race studies grads we promote, and there's not enough jobs here in the United States to do that work. So they'll send them abroad to teach that same nonsense. And that's what it was. They're throwing all these money at, at, at Westerners. They're paying them to go there and they're getting danger pay and they get overtime and they get everything. So, so much of the money that we spent when we talk about the trillion spent in Afghanistan, we're talking about mostly it was spent on Westerners. Fascinating. So you're saying this is just, you know, kind of one piece of a much broader effort that essentially works the same way? Yeah. The different things that look, there were important things that were um, that were built. For instance, there were there were lots of schools. The U.S. went in, and this is actually something that often the Pentagon and the State Department and others would collaborate on, going to different neighborhoods and building schools. But here's the thing: when you build a school in a particular area, because you're putting a school in that, when we know this in the United States, when we step away from it, you're empowering one area, right? One area has a has a a better school, say, a better school district, uh, a better football team, um, a, a, a better a better music department, a better Spanish department, right? So people want to live there and people are attracted to that. When you do that in a place like Afghanistan, you are empowering certain warlords or certain tribal leaders at the expense of others, right? So you are throwing off the balance of power there. You're not building it for Afghanistan, the nation. You are empowering certain people and hurting others in, uh, in a dynamic that we have still have no understanding how this works. So I've heard different people saying, you know, well, <laughs> there are times that we would go back uh, a month or so later and there's no more school that's standing there. So even the good things that the United States did were mistaken. They were not appropriate. We face this all the time with the national police force and we're talking about and we're talking about how we help the Palestinians with aid. Yeah, help build a police force, help build a uh, help build a group that can help protect Palestinians. Except this is we can call it whatever they want, but that's not how they see it. They see it as a way for processing money, right? To to do different favors for different members of the tribe, for different clients. That's what we were doing. So when we were not paying our own clients, meaning other Americans, we were helping them distribute money to their own clients. It's, so the things that were supposed to have gotten built in order to build democracy or an army or a police force or schools, it was a waste. And so you have to ask yourself, how did they not understand this? Over 20 years, they didn't see these institutions torn down. They didn't understand that the Afghan National Army w was a joke. It was never going to happen. Of course, they understood it was a joke. And that's what I mean when I say this is an American issue fundamentally. It's our corruption. It's our refusal not our refusal to look reality in the face. Once we looked reality in the face, we said, big deal. It's still helping us pay a whole bunch of people and it's processing a whole bunch of people through important systems. That's all that matters. It was an enormous offshore laundering operation for money, for reputations, for prestige. It's, it's, it's far and away the most shameful and most corrupting military engagement in our history. So, I mean, this is obviously, you know, a, a huge in, indictment of of the U.S. leadership and so forth. And I mean, we're but this is more than just spending money, right? This is, you know, many people's lives, and you know, and oh, American yes. and Afghani. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's terrible. I'm, we, you know, we all know. A, I think you and I spoke about this a bit before. You and I when you walk down the streets or your cities, your town and stuff, you see young men who, who don't have legs. And a lot of these young men served in Afghanistan or Iraq. And so the, the, the human cost, I mean, there are children who grew up without their fathers or mothers. So the human cost is just enormous. And then when you look at the level of corruption, when you look at why people were doing it, people were not looking out for the, never mind the welfare of Afghanis, Look at, they were not looking out for the welfare of American citizens, right? It's, it's, it's terrible.
And so that was the point really of that piece, not just to talk about how powerful the Taliban was because of this very intense focus on, on primacy and how this group was cohesive because of a shared religion, a shared, shared tribe, shared environment. It's also talking about how our leadership, not our country, my point was here is that America is still a great country. You look right now, people are scrambling. How do we help the Afghanis? Don't we owe them something? They help save American lives. These people, America is a great country with great people. Our leadership does not deserve this country. And over the last 20 years, they've proved that. This leadership is uh, delirious and deracinated. They are so removed from the needs, from the ambitions, the strengths of this country, that's the shame. And Afghanistan showed us that, along with other things. But Afghanistan shows us that more, most clearly, a 20-year lesson in how corrupt our leadership has become.